Welcome to yes another edition of Expert Talks by Calkine TV. I'm Sage and today's guest is Mr Tim Harcourt, an economist with many titles. In fact, you may already know of him from his work as journalist and presenter for Sky News, where his popular book, The Airport Economist, has been produced into a TV series. He is the industry professor and chief economist at Sydney's UTS and has been the economic advisor to South Australia's premier and I'm sure he has many accolades to his name that we haven't mentioned today. So we're very lucky to share some space today with Tim to gain some insight into the trending issues and their economic significance. This should be an interesting show if I do say so myself. So bringing you live today we have esteemed and well-travelled Chief Economist Mr Tim Harcourt who has fit us in his busy shooting schedule for his new TV series The Big Picture. Welcome to the show Tim. Thanks, Sage, and thanks for that very generous introduction. I'm also looking forward to talking with you. Oh, fantastic. Thank you again, Tim. And you have a remarkable career history. We are ever so grateful to have you on the show today. Could you share with us the significance of your family upbringing and influences to your career progression, please? I have a bit of an un unusual background. My ancestry is actually Transylvanian, and people think that's a natural progression from Transylvania to Dracula to economists to bloodsuckers. But in actual fact, my my, uh, my great-grandfather, Israel Harkovich, came out to Australia in the 19th century. And he and his wife and brother-in-law had a boat called the Wandering Jew that went round the New South Wales country um, selling goods. So we were basically exporters and importers, you know, 150 years ago. And I think my life as a travelling economist uh, you know, reflects those, those roots. They had a, uh, a paddle steamer called the Wandering Jew that went around the countryside. And uh, so I think my itchy feet comes from that background stage. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah. And as they say, if the hat fits, <laughs> why don't you wear it? So exactly. Tim, you've also authored several books, the most recent being The Airport Economist Flies Again. Correct me if I'm wrong there. No, you're spot on. You're right up to date stage. And that's a sequel to The Airport Economist, which is also a successful TV series. Could you explain how your books have helped Australians to navigate business in the APAC regions, please? Well, it was, in some ways it was been accidental. I was Chief Economist of Austrade, the, the trade agency that helps Australian exporters. So I travelled a lot. And I thought whilst I travel, I might as well write articles about every country I visited. So, you know, I initially started off going to China and, and Korea and Japan, Southeast Asia. Uh, and from there, it sort of grew. Uh, and um, most, uh, you know, parts of the world, the Australian media didn't have people, you know, in Mongolia and, and Kazakhstan. But I found with my Austrade role as chief economist, I was going to all these places. So I started writing about what makes countries tick and why does Singapore have you know, lots of uh, engineers and financial consultants, but not many ballet dancers and those types of things. And I decided to write the story of each country and also where the opportunity was for Australia. And it sort of took off from there. It started as a book. Uh, Julia Gillard, the then Prime Minister, launched it. Uh, and then there was the TV show and the podcast and the, you know, and the sequel that uh, you, you pointed out, The Airport Economist Flies Again, that was brought out because a lot of countries that weren't in the first book, like Peru and uh, Colombia and Finland, complained. Where was their chapter in The Airport Economist Mark 1? So I ended up having to visit all these other countries so I could write The Airport Economist Flies Again. And uh, I think, Sage, I've been to about 60 countries in the six years before COVID. So I managed to see a lot of the world and talk about their economies. That is fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. It must be a very exciting role to take on, travelling the world like that and, and sharing your experiences with uh, Australians and uh, anyone else who's willing to read the book. Yeah, that's right. I had a funny experience, Sage, where um, I was actually in London uh, with the Premier of South Australia at the time, Jay Weatherall. We went to a alumni function, but Sasha Baron Cohen was also there in his role as, I think, the Admiral... The, the dictator and I told him in character that I was going to Kazakhstan the next week and he said say hello to my friend Borat he's a journalist there and then when I did go to Kazakhstan the other speaker at my conference was Tony Blair the British Prime Minister and I told him the whole story of meeting Sasha Baron Cohen and Borat and Tony Blair said to me what a funny job you've got you go all the way to London to meet Borat 
and all the way to Kazakhstan to meet Tony Blair, which I guess, I guess he was right. Very interesting indeed. Now, let's talk a little bit about your trips to China. China's in the, in the news a lot these days, especially with the Beijing Winter Olympics coming up. And they've put some regulations on spectators and attendees, unfortunately, because of the rise of COVID cases. How do you think this is global event will aid or hinder China's economy? It's a very good question, Sage. I was at the uh, Beijing Olympics in the Summer Olympics in 2008. In fact, Kevin Rudd, then the Prime Minister, launched another one of my books. But as soon as a Prime Minister launches my book, they seem to get rolled, so I could probably get a, a journalist instead. But um, at the Beijing Summer Olympics, that was at the peak of Australian-Chinese relations. We had the liquefied natural gas deal. A lot of the buildings that were built for the Summer Olympics, the water cube, uh, the bird's nest, were built by Australian architects. So it was really a high point of China-Australia relations. Now, in the Winter Olympics, and Beijing is the only only city uh, to, to, to host both, um, it's quite different. As you say, there's COVID. As you say, there's diplomatic tensions. And China is, of course, not allowing international tourists uh, into the country. So. Uh, in some ways, I think the Winter Olympics, which is already a smaller scale economically compared to the Summer Olympics, the Winter Olympics is really about developing uh, some of the poor regions in China that have mountains that are, could get some potential from winter sports. I think Beijing has uh, produced something like, they've developed something like 800 uh, uh, ski, ski, new ski resorts, uh, I think 650 new ice rinks. So I think they're using the Winter Olympics really to build up a good winter sports industry in the parts of northern China, the, the colder parts that really need some economic development. I think the Summer Olympics for Beijing was about China and the world. I think this one is principally about developing that part of China, uh, you know, domestically. Thank you. So um, China's One Belt, One Road initiative is, is a lot to unpack. It's come into the spotlight more recently and has been operating for quite some time, however. Um, along with the tensions that have been surrounding the Beijing Winter Olympics and some of the nation's decision to not sign the Olympic Treaty, there are also criticisms about how this One Belt, One Road uh, initiative could impact smaller economies and how, in your opinion, is this going to support China's goals of building up their middle class? Well, I think, Sage, you're right. I, th I think One Belt, One Road was seen as a way to build up the modern version of the Silk Road when you know, China was very instrumental to world trade routes. Uh, and it's got that, uh, you know, it's got that feel for it, a sort of, you know, modern day Silk Road. Uh, but in some cases, particularly in the Pacific and in, in Africa, uh, there have been uh, demands put of very large loans for building infrastructure like key airports and, and sports stadiums uh, for soccer in Africa and so on. And it means that a lot of countries have been indentured to China in terms of loans, which could be quite difficult for them. And in some ways, I think um, the, the One Belt, One Road policy is more about Geopolitics, it's more about strengthening uh, China's place in the world, uh, like the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. It's like instead of building the WTO and the IMF, which China sees as very much European American institutions, they want to build their own institutions. I think Belt and Road is part of that. Um, economically, uh, I don't think it's quite got the same case, but geopolitically, I can see why strategically China's used One Belt and Road uh, the way it has in terms of. Uh, locking countries into to infrastructure investments. Mm, thank you so much for sharing your insights there. It is a very big topic and it, we could, you could probably talk for hours on it. So thank you for succinctly relaying that information. How do you think now if we move on to um, the telecommunications space, how do you believe the ban from UK and Australia on Huawei's 5G services will further impact the foreign relations with China? It's been interesting, hasn't it? I mean, we've had this issue with Huawei in Australia, in the UK, uh, in in Europe, uh, both Central Europe and Western Europe. Um, I think the issue here is it's not just about telecommunications, but a lot of it's to do with uh, security and being able to listen to people. And, you know, it's quite clear that China has large state-owned enterprises that are not, you know, 
individual in, individual independent companies, uh, you know, like like a Telstra or like uh, General Electric, they are you know, related to the Chinese state. So anything to do with telecommunications has you know, has cyber security and has tele, has uh, you know, issues of state involved. So I think that's why countries have been very cautious uh, about Huawei. Um, Malcolm Turnbull, who I interviewed on uh, the big picture, uh, suggested that that was when some of the geopolitical tensions started, was when Australia started being cautious with Huawei uh, about 5G. And that was something that, as you say, we saw in the UK, uh, we've seen in Europe, and we've seen uh, uh, right, a, right around the world. It's not just uh, Australia that's had issues with Huawei, it's countries all, o- all over the world, mainly because of the, uh, you know, the need to separate you know, business decisions from, from issues of geopolitics. Right, thank you so much. Yes, national security is becoming more of a salient issue for Australia these days. And um, I think it's important that they do place extra um, importance to this issue. So we have to start winding up the discussion now, Tim. Uh, but I have to say I've read your book, The Airport Economist, or most of it, and I found it very inspiring. In fact, uh, it's instigated me to write a film, and uh, just a short one. Well, but uh, Yeah, so... Hopefully, if you can get your hands on it or watch the series out there, please do, because it is very inspiring, especially if you're trying to get a small business up off the ground. So, Tim, what are your predictions as a chief economist for the trajectory of Australia's economy this year, please? Do you think we're going to risk a fiscal drag? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, one good thing about COVID is that we've got away from this debt and deficit uh, fetish that we used to have. I mean, we know that the most important thing is to uh, keep people employed, uh, you know, to drive unemployment down. And uh, the budget deficit or surplus is really a, a means to that end. And I think for a long time in Australia, for political reasons, we're in a recession with uh, you know, having, having a surplus and uh, being concerned about debt when there's no reason for Australia to worry about our position fiscally. So I think the most important thing will be to ensure the labour market improves and um, for the Reserve Bank to keep its nerve uh, on inflation, which according to yesterday's decision it has. I think Philip Lowe is a very careful, cautious person, so I think he and the Reserve Bank won't get too spooked by the inflation pennies, which are predominantly to do do with um, the disruptions to global supply chains that we've seen in in the international market. So uh, I think uh, if we can get over Omicron and if we can uh, see, uh, you know, proper vaccination boost, boosters and so on, and a, a move to not completely normal, but to a post-COVID world, uh, I think Australia can manage itself economically reasonably well. Thank you, Tim, for your words there. And it's it's promising to see that we have in New South Wales uh, for small businesses just been offered uh, some further support through Service New South Wales as well. So um, it's good to see that the government is doing what they can to help businesses during this time. Thanks, Tim. Before we close off the discussion, was there anything you'd like to add for our viewers out there before you go? Well, I think um, for those people that get worried about uh, bad headlines and, um, and fear, remember that Australia is one of the best places in the world to be uh, when it comes to the, the pandemic. And uh, for all the fear you'll see in the media, uh, Australia's got very good fundamentals. So if we are very sensible about our public health messages and we get ourselves vaccinated and we uh, are reasonably careful with what we do, then I think it's important now to allow uh, the economy and small business to, to come back and recover some ground that they've lost uh, during COVID. And I've got great faith in entrepreneurs in Australia and small business, we're very adaptable. We've been able to adapt to bushfires, uh, to climate challenges, to floods, to famine, to all sorts of things. So I think that uh, I'm reasonably optimistic that this year will be much better than last year and the year before. There is definitely a very strong spirit bonding Australians, especially during these times. They really do have a resilience there to push through. And it's a very auspicious time to meet you on the road to the election campaign as well. So I'm sure you'll be your comments would be more um, in demand during this time. So thank you for fitting us in. No worries. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you so much for watching. Hopefully you gained something from that very interesting discussion we just had with Mr. Tim Harcourt, the Chief Economist at UTS and Sky News presenter. 
The full interview will be available from YouTube via Calkine Media, so keep watching for more of the live expert talks and live market updates. Until the next episode, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine.